Hello everyone, September. In 1986, a large chunk of ice broke off from the outer edge of the Ron Ice Shelf in West Antarctica. Initially named A2A, it was soon realized that this piece, covering an area of about 4,170 square kilometers, 1610 square miles, was the largest iceberg in the world. After a while, this massive chunk of ice grounded itself on the seafloor, eventually turning into an iceberg. However, after more than 30 years, in 2023, A2A started moving again. Currently, it's drifting at a speed of over 150 kilometers per month in the Weddell Sea along the coast of Antarctica. Does this signify more dangerous events to come in Antarctica? What happens if all the ice in Antarctica melts, or what exactly is this horrifying blood waterfall spurting from the glacier? In today's video, we'll explore and try to answer all these questions. Antarctica, from the perspective of humanity, is a relatively new place. Looking at ancient maps, we see vague outlines in the region where this continent exists. During those times, this region was generally referred to as the Southern Land. On the other hand, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle mentioned the Antarctic region in his work on meteorology around 350 BC. However, the discovery and identification of these lands as a continent happened in the 19th century. In fact, the first confirmed image of Antarctica was captured in 1820, highlighting how late this discovery was compared to Christopher Columbus finding America over 300 years earlier. Even in the 19th century, there was significant debate about what these lands truly were. The official recognition of Antarctica as a continent took another 20 years. Since then, numerous explorations and studies have fascinated the scientific community, unraveling many discoveries about the continent. Research indicated that Antarctica covered an area of over 14.2 million square kilometers, 5.5 million square miles, indicating the presence of a considerably vast continent. However, the size of Antarctica was metaphorically just the tip of the iceberg. We know that the largest glaciers on the planet are found here. But did you know that Antarctica houses nearly 98% of the world's ice, excluding sea ice and considering only continental ice? Even if we exclude the ice shelves and focus solely on the continental ice, we're dealing with an area of almost 14 million square kilometers, 5.4 million square miles, containing a staggering 26.5 million cubic kilometers of ice. Additionally, the weight of one cubic kilometer of ice is about 0.92 metric gigatons. This implies that the ice sheet of Antarctica weighs approximately 24,380,000 gigatons. Some parts of the ice on the continent are about 4 kilometers thick. Thus, if all this ice were to melt, global sea levels would rise by about 58 meters, spelling disaster for densely populated coastal regions worldwide. We're talking about scenarios where cities like New York or London would vanish entirely, and entire countries like the Netherlands would be submerged. On the other hand, this vast ice reserve isn't just about water. The water here is fresh water, not something readily found on our planet. Approximately 70% of the fresh water on Earth is stored in Antarctica. Now, what if we were to tell you that Antarctica is considered a desert? Indeed, the continent is regarded as the driest place on Earth. How can the place with the most water be a desert, you might ask? Well, when we think of deserts, we often imagine scorching heat, sandstorms, and dunes. But in reality, the term desert is not exclusive to hot, sandy places. It primarily relates to rainfall levels. Any region where there is no rain or snowfall can be termed a desert. Antarctica fits this definition perfectly. The annual precipitation in the South Pole is only about 15 millimeters, while the average annual precipitation in the Sahara Desert is about 76 millimeters. Some coastal regions in Antarctica may occasionally witness a form of precipitation, but it's irregular and inadequate. Hence, the continent's precipitation level is significantly lower compared to other deserts. The reason Antarctica qualifies as a true desert despite being covered by a thick ice sheet is that the region lacks substantial precipitation. Another unique aspect of Antarctica is that it doesn't belong to any country or entity. Yet, Antarctica has its own country code, top-level internet domain, and even a flag. However, many things here don't function as they typically would. 
For instance, there is no division based on time zones, and each research station operates on its own time. So, asking what time it is in Antarctica can yield multiple answers. Therefore, the concept of a day is relative in Antarctica. When we say daytime, it refers to when it's bright outside. At the South Pole, daytime lasts for 184 days, from September 21st to March 23rd, where the sun never sets and merely traces a circular path along the horizon. During the period when the sun sets, a prolonged period of darkness ensues. Hence, there are no clear signs of day and night in the continent due to these harsh conditions. Due to these extreme conditions, there is no native population in Antarctica. However, depending on the season, there can be a population of 1,000 to 5,000 individuals, consisting of researchers and government personnel in accessible areas of the continent. These individuals must meet specific criteria for their roles in the more accessible regions, with requirements becoming even stricter in more remote areas. For instance, individuals who haven't had their appendix removed may face certain challenges. But why is that? Is there a specific virus affecting appendices in Antarctica? Let's delve a bit into the past. On April 29, 1961, a 27-year-old Soviet doctor and Antarctic researcher, Leonid Ragazov, began experiencing some worrying symptoms such as weakness, nausea, fever, and pain in the lower right abdomen. As the sole doctor among the 13-member team, he diagnosed himself with acute appendicitis. There were no planes at nearby Antarctic stations, and adverse weather conditions didn't allow for evacuation. It seemed like a death sentence. Nevertheless, the doctor was brave enough to decide to perform an appendectomy on himself as it was the only way to survive. Setting aside the chilling details of this process, we can say that an extremely challenging yet successful surgery took place, earning the young doctor worldwide acclaim. The six-month days and nights in Antarctica might make it seem like a place from another planet. But there are even more interesting things that can account for this, and no, we're not talking about aliens, at least for now. Antarctica happens to be an excellent location for meteorite hunting. Nearly two-thirds of the world's meteorites have been discovered here. The reason is quite simple. It's not that meteorites fall more frequently on the continent, but rather, they are easier to find here. The terrain in the region is perfect for searches, spotting dark-colored rocks amidst vast snowy areas is relatively easy. Additionally, glacier movements prevent meteorites from sinking too deep, making them nearly always close to the surface. During a recent exploration from 2022 to 2023, an international research team retrieved five new meteorite samples. During the research, it was found that one of these fragments weighed 7.6 kilograms, signifying its considerable weight. According to Maria Fernandez, a researcher at the Field Museum of Natural History and Chicago University, approximately 45,000 meteorites have been collected from Antarctica in just the last century, and only around 100 of these resembled the 7-kilogram sample. Antarctica isn't solely a continent of ice and snow. In 2010, the lowest temperature recorded here was minus 92 degrees, making it the lowest temperature ever recorded on Earth. During the Antarctic summer, which lasts from November to March in the Southern Hemisphere, even cruise ships can make their way to Antarctica. However, during the winter months, the region takes on a chillingly different aspect. So, when you think of Antarctica, what comes to mind apart from ice and cold? Perhaps something related to the ozone hole? You may have heard about it, but you might not be familiar with the details. For years, numerous reports have highlighted a significant decline in ozone concentration in the upper layers of the atmosphere over Antarctica. Remember, contrary to common misconceptions, the ozone hole over Antarctica is not a static occurrence, it's more of a seasonal phenomenon. This abnormality was first detected in 1985 by a group of British scientists who found a region with low ozone concentration appearing every August and disappearing by December. It was understood that this process indicated a more worrying occurrence. Scientists were curious about how this phenomenon occurred and what its progression might entail. The most plausible theory about its origin was related to human activities, such as the use of chlorofluorocarbons and around 100 other substances. 
The scientific community immediately sounded the alarm about this. In 1985, the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer was signed, followed by the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer in September 1987. Since then, things have been progressively improving every passing year. In fact, there's visible evidence that the ozone hole shrinks each year. Some individuals believe that the ozone hole over Antarctica will completely disappear by 2066. This perspective is even reflected in UN reports. However, in recent years, other concerns might have surfaced. Satellite data from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts revealed a troubling trend. The ozone hole over Antarctica started abnormally expanding earlier this year, prompting scientists to raise alarms. According to Dr. Martin Yeager, a researcher from the University of New South Wales Climate Change Research Center, this premature expansion was an unexpected development. If the ozone hole expands beyond its normal size, it might lead to further warming of the Southern Ocean's waters. Additionally, the region is currently witnessing record low sea ice levels, and increased ultraviolet radiation might further reduce these levels. Nevertheless, we don't have enough data yet to draw definitive conclusions despite the extremely challenging conditions. Antarctica holds many captivating mysteries waiting to be discovered, despite seeming quite ordinary. Let's start with something seemingly mundane, a river. You might think there's nothing unusual about a river, but the Onyx River is quite important for Antarctica. It holds the title of Antarctica's longest river, spanning only 32 kilometers. What sets this river apart is its behavior. It flows for only about two months a year. For most of the year, the riverbed is frozen, appearing as if time has stopped. However, during the short summer season, a magical transformation occurs. The Onyx River springs to life and begins to flow. Antarctica's unique hydrological system plays a crucial role in this river's behavior. As you can see, the continent is home to complex subglacial lakes and river networks, all beneath a thick ice sheet. When the summer sun heats the surface of the ice, it melts, creating water that trickles down to reservoirs beneath the glacier. As pressure builds, the water is forced to the surface, creating rivers like the Onyx. Despite its short but intense flow period, this barren land creates a vital ecosystem in the valley. The cold waters from the valley nourish rare life forms on the continent. There are no fish in the river, but microorganisms and algae thrive. However, what's more intriguing than where the river flows is the location it flows through. The river runs in what's essentially the driest place on the planet. The area is so dry that even the driest regions of the Atacama Desert, which haven't seen rain for 400 years, can't compare. These places are known as the McMurdo Dry Valleys. These valleys, formed by long gone glaciers, feature steep slopes and vast plains. They're referred to as oases of Antarctica because they aren't covered in ice or snow, but they bear no resemblance to the oases we typically know. Deserts like the Sahara are havens for life, while the McMurdo Dry Valleys are literally the most lifeless places on Earth. Researchers couldn't find any signs of life in soil samples taken from the driest and coldest place. It might sound absurd, but the region is so similar to certain places on Mars that NASA uses it as a testing ground for Viking landers. Moreover, these lands hold mysteries that modern science can't comprehend. For instance, the mummified bodies of seals found in these valleys are slowly decomposing in the cold, dry air. It's possible that some of these creatures died hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago. However, why these animals came here remains unknown. One theory suggests that the seals lost their bearings as they weakened. The reason for such aridity and the absence of life in Antarctica is that much of its ice and snow didn't form due to phenomena like snowfall. Rather, the source of these formations is atmospheric deposition. We can liken this to frost accumulating on the surfaces of ancient refrigerators without a defrost system. On the other hand, the annual precipitation in the dry valleys is only 25 millimeters. Even this small amount evaporates quickly. Moreover, the low humidity due to periodic catabatic winds is a defining factor in the region. These winds are cold, dry air currents that reach speeds of up to 320 kilometers per hour. 
This sets a world record. These factors explain why the valleys aren't covered in ice. The region has remained this way for about 8 million years. However, as nonsensical as it might sound, there's a waterfall in the Taylor Valley, right next to the driest place on the planet. But we're not talking about just any waterfall, this is the Blood Falls. The name, of course, is figurative, the color isn't due to blood. Initially, when the falls were discovered by Australian geologist Griffith Taylor in 1911, they believed the red color was from red algae. However, this assumption was later disputed. Today, it's suggested that the fall's blood-red hue is the result of a complex chemical reaction and has been flowing for 1.5 million years. Amazing, isn't it?